At about 11.30, I woke up, feeling some pitching motion in the ship and aware of the sound of breakers. A nasty sea had already got up and Solace had swung round towards the reef. We were lying off a lee shore within 100 yards of the breakers with a rapidly rising sea and wind. Pitch dark, raining, the anchor chain was clearly foul of a rock and liable to part at any moment. And the engine was useless. This is Rose Clark. Rose is reading an excerpt from a book written by her father, Victor, about his trip around the world in a small wooden sailboat with only a teenage mate. This passage is about their dramatic shipwreck in November of 1954 on the reef surrounding a place in the Pacific Ocean called Palmerston Island. The ship was pitching like a rocking horse. It had all the appearance and feeling of having parted. There was now no hope. It was a matter of seconds. I sent Stanley below for the lifeboats and we had scarcely put them on when the keel, thank God it was an iron one, struck with a jarring shock. We clung to the rigging, smothered by the seas, as the ship was hurled by... Oh, it's getting a bit emotional for me. OK. Um... We clung to the rigging, smothered by the seas, as the ship was hurled by the series of crashing breakers onto the reef. During the next six hours, the tide fell. It was barely light when we saw the islanders coming out to us, some in canoes, some over the reef. There was a lot of long faces, but little was said. The ship was obviously holed, though she didn't look a wreck. But what a position to be in. On a reef, exposed to wind and water, on a tiny coral atoll with only 70 inhabitants, hundreds of miles from anywhere, almost thousands from civilization. I think I'm a born optimist, but my heart was never nearer my boots than at that moment. For Victor Clark, his mate Stanley, and surprisingly enough, decades later, for Victor's daughter, Rose, this is the trip that changed everything. Hi, I'm Jonathan Gruber, and this is The Journey. The Journey is an original podcast from KLM Royal Dutch Airlines, where we meet extraordinary people whose lives are transformed by travel. The story of the shipwreck you just listened to is an excerpt from the book On the Wind of a Dream, written by Rose's father. Rose is 37, tall, like her father, ginger and English, and she knows her dad's stories by heart. Her childhood was filled with tales of his adventures on the high seas, the whales, the storms, and all the exciting details. Well, Victor found them exciting. For Rose, not so much. In one sense, he would love to tell his stories, you know, if people came around for dinner or whatever, and I think I just switched off. I think I just didn't realise how amazing he was. The one place, the one story that Victor returned to again and again was the shipwreck on Palmerston Island. So it's between New Zealand and America in the South Pacific Ocean, probably a bit closer to New Zealand. And it's kind of like halfway around the world from where I am in England. And it is a couple of hundred miles from the nearest other island, the nearest other Cook Island. Palmerston doesn't have shops or anything, so we're literally talking 200 miles away for the nearest shop. Depending on the time of year, 50 to 80 people live on this atoll that is part of the Cook Islands. Almost everyone on the island is a descendant of the original settler, the English sailor and carpenter, William Marsters. Back in 1863, he brought three Polynesian wives to the island, which is divided up between the three families to this day. Palmerston is the only Cook Island where English is the first language, albeit with some anachronistic usages. Palmerston is also, without exaggeration, one of the most remote inhabited places on Earth. And despite having crashed his boat on its reef that fateful November night in 1954, and being forced to stay here far longer than he had ever planned or imagined, Palmerston was a place Victor Clark came to love deeply. He always said that 
Palmerston was his favourite place in the world and his favourite time of life. We used to joke and say, are we not your happiest time of life? What about your your wife and your kids? And he used to do his raucous laughter. And, um, you know, we all used to laugh about it. It was an incredible time for him. And the people of Palmerston were on in his thoughts and prayers every day for the rest of his life. Why were the people of Palmerston in his thoughts and prayers until the end of his days? Why was his time here the happiest time of his life? Why exactly... Was Palmerston so special to Victor Clark? Here's why. <music> Lieutenant Commander Victor Clark had retired from the British Navy a mere two months when he set out on a 33 foot, all white catch, a two mast wooden sailboat called Solace. His plan? To sail the world. <laughs> he was having a really rough time in the Navy and, uh, yeah, so wanted to escape and have his trip round the jolly world, go for an adventure. And for his trip, Victor needed a ship's mate. My name is Stanley Matthew Ray, born 14th March 1937. While on the Caribbean island of St. Lucia, Victor met the then 16-year-old islander Stanley Matarin. Stanley was already locally famous for his sailing prowess, and he was looking for new adventures. So when Commander Clark turned up in Solace, introductions were made. He was a retired naval officer, and he knew that my great ambition was to go to sea and be a captain. He figured that was a good opportunity for me to go to sea. He said that he liked the cut of my jib or something like that. And so the next thing I knew, I was gone. They left the Caribbean in January 1954 and set sail towards the Pacific Ocean. Everything went well until November of the same year when Victor and Stanley stopped at Palmerston. They had stopped off at Palmerston and uh, you have to anchor outside the reef because you couldn't take the boat into the lagoon. Well, we were on board and uh, it started blowing. And, um, well, we figured we'd better take up the anchor and steal away, you know. What did you think to yourself the moment you realized everything was going wrong? Well, I thought, that's it, you know, we throw it on the reef. Yes, I still remember what he looks like. And his friend that he brought with him from the Caribbean, Stanley, he was only 16 when he came here. This is Bill Marsters. He's the son of Tuakana and Inano Marsters, the family who took Victor and Stanley in after the crash. I managed to reach him via Skype, something they have there these days. Bill was only six at the time, but he has vivid memories of the time of the shipwreck. It took a great effort, but the islanders managed to get the badly battered solace on the beach. There were barely any tools and no electricity, so everything had to be done by hand. It took nine months to make it seaworthy again, but when it was, the duo set sail, but used Palmerston as a base while crisscrossing the Pacific. All told, they were on Palmerston for more than two years. Victor and Stanley enjoyed life on the island greatly. This is what Victor wrote in his book. I shall never cease to marvel at my good fortune in getting wrecked on Palmerston. If I had wanted to get wrecked and had had the whole world to choose from, I could never have found a better place. Green, waving palm trees, white sandy beaches trimmed with verdant bushes, blue lagoon, cooled by trade wind, no noises other than nature's, wholesome food in abundance, Robinson Crusoe did not do nearly so well. As time passed, Bill Marsters remembers how Victor and Stanley integrated themselves into life on Palmerston. He always have uh, classes for the kids to study about the, the Bible and singing hymns. As you can imagine, the arrival of two new men for an extended period of time was kind of a big deal, full of grand moments carved into the history of Palmerston Island. Moments like the airdrop. We had to light a fire so that the pilot could see how the wind was blowing in order to know how, where to drop his parachute with all the stuff. 
screws and bolts and nuts and and glue and, and stuff to help with the repairs. I was all excited. This little, this boy from St. Lucia, you know, <laughs> all this is happening to him, you know. <laughs> I mean, I was living a dream. Newspapers worldwide ate up the story of the daring airdrop delivering supplies to a shipwrecked naval commander. Victor Clark had some notoriety back then. Not just because of his daring circumnavigation of the planet in a tiny wooden catch, but also because Victor was a decorated war hero who saw extraordinary action in the Pacific. He was bombed a few times in ships in the ocean. He swum in shark-infested water for a few nights with a broken arm on a piece of old barrel or wood or something. I think he absolutely believed that God had his back. That was always his verse in life, is that he knew that moment he was in the water that God had his back and that he would survive it. Survive the ocean, survive the sharks, and eventually got rescued by someone and then betrayed. And then he was a Japanese prisoner of war. Um, and that is something he never spoke about, and I think that's a lot to do with the pain that they all suffered. He saw incredibly awful things. After the war, Victor was passed over for promotion and given a desk job. He resigned and immediately began his ambitious trip around the world that lasted more than five years. Back in England, at a youthful 68 years of age, he married a woman 30 years his junior and had two daughters. Rose was born when Victor was 72. Despite his advanced years, Rose says he was an energetic father and, because he was already retired, always around. Well, he was around physically. Emotionally, he may have been somewhere else. Here's a tender moment Rose sent us of Victor Enterself. He used to love reading his stories. He would dress up and knock on the door as a different character each time and come and be that person for a Sunday afternoon. It was just really fun. I felt close to him, but it was only when I was older, at the age of 20, that I realised that I had dad issues in, in that I didn't know anything about an intimate father. There had been an emotional distance between us that I hadn't probably realised at the time. I don't think, as a child, I don't remember affectionate words being spoken to me. I don't particularly remember ever being told, I love you, by dad. So uh, as a family, we're not, we're, we're not very warm, affectionately like that. I think towards the end of dad's life, I, I learned to say, I love you. Yeah, and it was hard, but I got there. Did he ever say it back? He was in hospital one time, and I was just able to be really honest with him. But he, I think he just smiled because he probably actually couldn't talk at that point. Lieutenant Commander Victor Clark died in January of 2005 at 97 years of age. And as large as he was in life, that is how humble his funeral was. As far as mum's concerned, a, like when a body's dead, it's nothing because your spirit's gone to heaven and the body's just a body. So she wasn't precious about this kind of thing at all. We weren't in a great state when dad died. We had like a tiny family funeral with a few people um, and that was it. Dad had always envisioned horses with feathers and carrying his coffin on a, you know, a carriage, you know, like an important person would have. Um, and obviously he definitely didn't get that. Rose was 25 then. Meanwhile, she trained to be a special education teacher and got a good but demanding job. I had been working in a Manchester, uh, central Manchester primary school as a learning mentor, um, training as a therapeutic play worker to help with the children that were really troubled. I loved it, but I, as the years went on, I got increasingly burdened by it and I just felt more and more useless. Um, and I didn't know how to fix these people 
that were very broken. And I think that really began to frustrate and upset me. And it just became too much. And I guess you would say I got burnt out. Just like her father, Rose is a devoted Christian. She walks around with a worn, dog-eared Bible full of notes and comments written in the corners. But back then, Rose says she became alienated from her faith. I had begun to slip into patterns of life that weren't particularly helpful. Um, so I had started um, drinking a bit more excessively again. I had started dabbling in smoking weed again. But all the time going to church still, that was the thing. It felt like I was being really hypocritical because on one hand I was loving Jesus and knew that I was unconditionally loved by him. But then on the other hand, I was doing things that were just really not great for my quality of life and probably hurting other people along the way as well, I think. Add to that a difficult living situation and a complicated and unfulfilling love life. But just then, a couple of remarkable things kind of came together. Her cousin inherited Solace, the sailing boat Victor Clark and Stanley circumnavigated the world with. Rose and he were refurbishing Solace together. They came across all kinds of silent witnesses to the long journey Solace made with her father, like the improvised nails the Palmerston Islanders used to stitch her together. She started rereading her father's book about his voyage around the world. And when she was a child, her father's stories often bored her. But now, for the first time, she found a new appreciation for her father's amazing feats. And she was particularly curious about his time on Palmerston Island. Yeah, so I was reading Dad's copy of On the Wind of a Dream and tucked in the front cover there was a piece of paper and it had a Palmerston telecom address. And I thought, wow, this could be my route in. So I emailed it and I said, for the attention of Mama Inano, and I wrote and I said, Dear Mama Inano, I have no idea if you remember who Commander Victor Clark is, um, but I'm his daughter and I am wondering if I could come and visit you because... You know, Palmerston was a great time of his life and he spoke very fondly of you and Tukana and all your family when I was growing up. So can I come and visit? Tuakana and Mama Inano were the people who took in Victor and Stanley. Despite the passage of nearly six decades, Mama Inano remembered them very well. She also told Rose she was more than welcome. So Rose prepared for the trip to tiny Palmerston Island that speck in the Pacific that played such an outsized role in her father's life. She took enough for a few months' travel. My cousin Tom said to me, are you going to take your dad's ashes? And I said, oh, if I've got room, I might. You know, it definitely wasn't a planned thing from my point of view. I had like a front pocket on the front of the rucksack. And uh, so I, I had a room. So I took some of dad's ashes, as many as I could fit in a jar. It was a, a big old peach jar that my mum had <laughs> lying around. Um, so I stuffed his ashes into this peach jar, screwed on the lid and thought that'll do. Why, why would you take your dad's ashes? Because it was the place he loved most in the world. Getting to Palmerston is still quite a journey. First, Rose flew to L.A., followed by a long flight to Rarotonga, the largest and most densely populated island of the Cook Islands. Mama Inano happened to already be there for a medical procedure, so the two met on the island, and together they prepared for the final leg to Palmerston. There are no ferries or flights there. The only way to get there from Rarotonga is to wait for a cargo ship that just happens to have Palmerston on its route. They waited a month for the ship to take a trip, which even today is not for the faint of heart. So going across on the journey, you all lie on the deck like little sardines in a tin, wrapped up in my sleeping bag. Uh, we had a tarpaulin over us in case it rained um, and to probably cover us from the wind a bit as well. There were people chucking, chucking over the edge, you know, being sick. And how long did it take? It's about three days, two nights. We had arrived at the night time when we were sleeping. I think the little boy Nariki, he had started to get excited when he'd peeled up the canvas to see that we'd arrived. And there was a light in the distance. And he said to me, oh, this is Palmerston, we're home, we're home. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. 
we get picked up by the little tin boat. You know, the islanders come out and they pick you and your stuff up and drive you back across the lagoon. And I was in the same boat as Mama in Anno. We stepped to shore and she put her arm around me and she said, welcome, my dear, you have fulfilled your father's dream. Because she knew that he'd always wanted to come back. Your eyes are tearing up a little. Yeah. <laughs> Every time. It hit me that that was what I was doing. I was coming to because of dad. Yeah. So who came out to greet you? All the island come down, you know, when they know that family members are coming back. They'll all come down to the seashore to welcome you if if they're physically able, yeah. Yeah, so big. I mean, that's a massive thing in itself. They, you know, they all come and give you a kiss or two kisses, always two kisses. I was explaining to them who I was and they would say, oh yeah, we know, we've grown up hearing stories about your father. Bill Marsters explains how Victor Clark is remembered on the island. Well, I think he was a really... uh... Uh, a good man, a Christian man, and everybody who was on the island knows him, what he had did for the island, eh? We never saw that uh, his uh, daughter will come back to, to follow up uh, her father's uh, uh, route, what he did. Rose settled onto the island, staying with Bill and Mama Inano, or Grammy, as Rose calls her, and then she showed them the peach jar with her father's ashes. I said to her, listen, I've got Dad's ashes. Is it okay if I scatter them in the lagoon or whatever? And she said, leave it with me, my dear. I'll speak to Bill, her son. Well, I just felt that uh, she was just following up to the uh, the history of her father. One of the reasons is to bring his ash back, but that's what the really aim, she said, she want to come to make her, to get approval, from the family, if she can bring her father's ash and bury it beside my father. I feel really uh, happy about it because I, my, my father had a lot of time with him and they seem to be work together as like brother. All the Palmerston Islanders then held a memorial service, laying Commander Victor Clark's ashes to rest in a manner closer to what he had envisioned. death to them is much more of a precious thing than it was to our family, you know. They would think the idea of throwing him in the lagoon or something was outrageous, you know, he needed a proper burial. And they were, you know, they they were so honoured that I had brought him home. So it was a really special thing for them. All the islanders came to the memorial service and the old mummers that were still alive that remembered him told their stories and memories about him. And um, we sung his, like, favourite hymn, um, Yeah, and it was just really special and definitely felt like it had been how it should have been. That's incredibly moving. Well, I mean, at the time I was a wreck, obviously, yeah. All my emotions that I'd pushed down for years came out and I, yeah, I definitely cried that day. And another thing was that um, on the day of his memorial... It rained and poured the whole day, and to Palmerston people, rain is such a blessing. So they were saying to me, oh my gosh, this is God's hand of blessing. Just the whole thing was amazing. I love to think that he saw it, yeah? I love to think that that you can look down from heaven and see what's going on. Rose's sojourn on the island helped her gain insight into a man she loved and respected but barely knew. Like his inner struggle with God, take the story of the night before the shipwreck. So he's having a quiet time on his boat that evening, um, just spending time like reading his Bible or in, you know, with God. And he felt like God said, I want you to stay and teach these people about me. And being the... <laughs> naval officer he was he said sorry lord i'm leaving in the morning and just left at that 
and it was that night that the wind changed direction suddenly and he got flung on the reef and ended up staying there for nine months. Is that how he said it to you? No, absolutely not. So I found that out from Mama in Anno when I got to the island. What did you think when you heard that? It was amazing. That makes so much more sense because he had always said that on his grave he would like sailor and missionary written. And I used to kind of laugh at him going, you weren't a missionary, what the heck are you talking about? But I see now why that made sense to me more because he had spent a lot of time teaching them about Jesus while he was there and God's love for them. Rose says that after that, she was done. She'd buried her father in the place he loved most, got to know him better, and finally closed off the chapter of his loss. Time to leave Palmerston Island behind, right? So my plan was to get a cargo ship to go back to Rarotonga and fly to New Zealand, where I would be for another few months and then go back to life in England. Um, But what happened is that a ship never turned up, so I missed my flight. So the ship never came, Rose missed her flight, and there was one more thing. Carly, yeah. She was seven or eight by then. Carly had behavioural difficulties and they didn't really know how to deal with her. She wasn't able to start school until they could get the funding for somebody to come and specially work with her. At that point, the local school principal found out that Rose had experience working with kids with special needs. So, of course, the principal asked Rose to stay. I said, no way. This is a tiny island, hundreds of miles away from anywhere else, and I am not going to stay here, but thank you anyway. Um, And then I think my conscience began to get the better of me because I realised that if I walked away, she would not be a seven or eight-year-old who hadn't started school. She would be a nine, ten, eleven-year-old that hadn't started school and hadn't had that chance for education. I totally believe that God uses his word to speak to us at situations where we need guidance. So the next morning I was walking around the beach doing my daily walk and there was a weird strip of red um, water right by the water's edge. It was bright red, um, a couple of hundred metres worth. And um, God spoke to me about the Red Sea and how he had parted the waves for the Israelites to leave Egypt to their freedom. Um, And... Uh, just said to me in my spirit, I'm going to make a way where there seems to be no way. I knew what I felt God was saying to me. Um, And then just thought, okay, there's nothing else I can do now. I'll stay on Palmerston. So, you plan to leave. Something happens that intervenes. You change your mind and you decide to stay. Where have I heard this story before? You have heard that with my dad. So for him, it was like a little argument with God. And for me, it was a God saying, this is the shape hole that I've carved out that you fit perfectly into. And it didn't take a shipwreck for me to say, OK, I'll stay. <laughs> a religious person would listen to this story and say, she read God's signs correctly. Others might say she was looking for reasons to stay. Whatever you believe, Rose who, like her father before her, had no intention of staying on one of the most isolated places on Earth, decided that, for now, Palmerston Island is home. And this is what Rosa's routine was like. So Carly was only in school for a few hours a day. So then in the afternoons, I would go into the main classroom and help out with all the other 20 however many kids. Rose says time is a relative thing on Palmerston. One day is much like the next. There is abundant fresh food, limitless sunshine. And Rose didn't exactly say this, but I'll say it. A sense of purpose. The feeling that she was there for a reason. In this new environment, far away from everything familiar, she could reinvent herself. I thought, okay, I'm going to try and live life without alcohol. And for me, alcohol had been a real confidence thing, especially um, socially. Um, It had always been a bit of a crutch for me. So um, to try and integrate into a little community um, without my false crutch of alcohol was a challenge. But, you know, it was one that I overcame and managed it. After that, I never drank alcohol again. And Rose changed her life in other small but significant ways. Apart from the alcohol thing, I would never step out of the house without a ton of eye makeup because I literally thought that I was gross and like people wouldn't want to see me as I am today. But when I got to Palmerston, 
I thought, okay, here's my chance. These are people that have never known me with makeup, so they're not going to know anything different. So then I stopped wearing makeup. That's a tiny, insignificant thing to a lot of people, but to me, that is just so freeing. How long did you stay in the end? Uh, four and a half years. Because I loved it. There was no reason not to be there. I just really loved it. I loved that slower pace of life. I loved learning how to enjoy my own company. At the end of four years, the day came that Rose returned to Britain. Bill and Grammy gave her a send-off befitting the departure of a member of the family. Took me to the beach where we always say goodbye um, when anyone's leaving. Um, same as when Dad was there, big semicircle of people all gathered um, and then they sang their Maori songs, traditional Maori song that they sing when people go. Um, and yeah, then all the kissing begins and all the tears, obviously, this time because it was a final goodbye. <laughs> Um, yeah, so very emotional. Especially saying goodbye to Grammy because I knew that it would probably be the last time that I saw her because she was in well into her 80s already. So that was really hard. I think I tried to tell myself that I would see her again just to make it easier. But I, I mean, we both knew that we wouldn't this side of heaven, so... Yeah, that was hard. She, she, like, physically found it difficult to let go of me. Yeah. Psalm 121, verse 8. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. And that's what they read for your father, right? Yeah, and for me. I think just a real send-off, you know, a real beautiful send-off. Now, when you were standing on that yacht and looking back at the island as the trees and the sand were fading in the coastline, what went through your head? Uh, I, I went to the um, end of the boat and just sat looking out to it. Um, yeah, and cried more. <laughs> yeah. Rose has been back in England for a year and a half. She works for a charity and loves it. And she says her time on Palmerston has changed her for the better. Are you happier? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I feel like I went a prisoner and came back free. I've learned lessons and I've carried them back into this busyness. And I'm determined not to get caught up in the rat race again. Do you understand your dad better, do you think? Yeah. What what part of his life do you think you understand better? Um, his need to find a purpose and just to run away from all the crap that life brings sometimes and go and... I hate that expression, find yourself. I guess for both... Well, for me, it was to find God in a more intimate place. Um, yeah, and just to experience the most loving people I've ever met. Honestly, they definitely gave me a different outlook on life, without a doubt. Yeah. You think you'll ever go back? Yeah, I'll go back, definitely. And whether that is to live for years or just to visit for months, I'm not sure, but I will, without a doubt, go back. Your father said that uh, his time on Palmerston was the happiest in his life. How about you? For me, I can say the same as well. If he were alive today, sitting here in this room, what would you say to him? I love you so much, Dad, and thanks for being an inspiration. Rose Clark. 
If you'd like to see pictures of Rose's time on Palmerston, or if you'd like to listen to an interview Victor Clark gave to the Imperial War Museum about his time on World War II, we will put them on our website, podcast.klm.com. Go and look. Go listen. They are fascinating. This was the last episode of the first season of The Journey, an original podcast brought to you by KLM Royal Dutch Airlines. To hear more stories about the trip that changed everything, go to podcast.klm.com. And why not review us on Apple Podcasts? It helps other listeners find this podcast. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Jonathan Gruber. <laughs>